Right. So, as we said, one of the things that we use, that we do in signals and systems is to evaluate how systems behave. And we usually do that, as we said, by being in a domain like the, the, the S domain, the Laplace domain. And if you look at, if you could figure the, the, the behavior without having to go back in time, that saves, it, it saves you a lot of effort overall. And that's the whole purpose of having a model uh, of whatever it is you're designing, because you want to see if the model behaves as it should before you go about getting the components and, and putting the thing together. So today we're going to look at, at from the equations themselves, the Laplace equations, how we can determine what sort of behavior to expect from first order and second order systems. As I mentioned before, higher order systems, you can usually cascade as a, as a, a first and a second order in some form. And usually when it gets in the very higher orders and so on, there are other things that you have to do that are outside of the scope of what we're doing here. And generally outside of the, at least the undergraduate work at this point. So we're going to concentrate on first and second orders and the principles apply as you get more complicated going forward. So if you recall from, from of course, your, your, your calculus and your math and so on, a general first order differential equation has a first order derivative for both the the y well if, if these are y and, and, and x we're dealing with has a, at least a first order derivative for both y and t somewhere inside of there it may not have both but it has to have at least one and then if we take the laplace transform of that equation and we assume that 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 the input um didn't have any value before time zero then it results in an equation looking like the one below, right? And you got to always do that for, I mean, for just, just to keep the, the practice in. And separate that a little bit now. There are a couple of things about that particular answer that you get. There's the first part of, it, of the answer here, this bit here, that deals only with the notice this is the initial condition on the on the the system what the system why is the output so let's say the system had some storage element in it like a capacitor for argument's sake why zero prime may have a value if it's a, a, a capacitor it will have a voltage if it's not totally discharged so when you start up the system at the point where the system initially responds depends on where it is starting. If it has some initial condition on it, so, so in a real world system, um, the motor, um, a motor might have been working already, or there's a, there's a vat of some um, chemical or, or, or a gas or something, of the, a, a, a container, a pressure vessel containing a gas, for instance, and it is already at a particular um, temperature and, and, and pressure, that Y0 minus will have some sort of value. So when you look at the response of the system now, the for a first order response, you get part of the response has to do with what the initial condition is. And then the other part now is tied to the input, right? If the initial condition is zero, so for instance, if, if it's a totally causal signal um, system and um, it is starting from scratch, so for instance, um, let's say a, a, a regulated power supply, so it's been off for a while, all the capacitors are discharged and so on. When you turn it on, they, it wouldn't have an initial condition response because there's no um, initial conditions on the system. All it will do now is whatever it responds to the input that you give it. Okay, you're going to meet both of them. Um, we spoke about causal signals or causal systems and signals, of course, are predictable because we know, at least for the input, that the input didn't exist before we to we, we actually activated the input. So we have a lot of control over that. And in terms of the initial conditions of the system, if the system is fairly predictable or, or we know what has been happening over a period of time, then we can have some ideas. I, I just say like, like, like a, um, in a process plan, for instance, a flow rate or a temperature rate or, or, or a weight or a mass of material or something like that so that at the point in time you when you make some change you at least have an idea where the system was at that point 
So how does this help us? Well, first of all, if the system is a first order system, and there are many, many, many systems like that. Temperature control systems are first order, for, for, for instance. Um, amplifier systems, they're taking something low and, and, and increasing the magnitude, are usually first order systems. Many of them are. They are flow systems that are first order. All right, you're going to meet some of those in your controls as well. So, it's, so there, are, there are hundreds of applications where the system response is in fact a first order. And if, they first, if it's a first order differential equation and the initial conditions are all zero, then we have a first order transfer function. Right, and remember what the transfer function is. The transfer function is when xs, or I should say when xt is an impulse. Right, implying that xs is one, then at that point in time, that this thing here is the system transfer function. Notice again, it's not quite a proper transfer function because we have the same order of s in numerator and as on the denominator. So what is the response of that turn impulse? The first thing you would do, as we said, is that because it is not proper, we have to divide the numerator by the denominator to get rid of the s on top. So if you do that, you get it now into, this is going to be some constant plus b over s plus a. Notice the s plus a going to follow you all the way through. All right? and if uh, you, you, you do your usual partial fractions business and you solve it, you're going to get a value for B. You're going to get a value for A that is that um, we, we, we um, will call some value uh, B1. And then on top of here, this is actually a B0 um, minus an AB1. Okay, however it is, whatever it is, the real numbers will, will turn out in, in, um, in, the, in the solution. So you do this, and then you take the inverse transform. Any number, and we remember this from, from a couple of weeks ago, any number in the Laplace domain, when you translate that back, or you go back from the, the S domain back into time, that's going to give you an impulse. And of course, any something 1 over S plus A gives you an E to the minus A T and then there's some coefficients in front. So what does that look like if I were to try and graph this thing out? If I put it here and you, you, you plot the thing, then what you get, the, the first part of it in time is this sudden rise here, right? So that's the delta part. So as you put uh, the, the impulse response of the system has a sudden sharp rise at the the in, uh, at the input, and then it dies down. So the impulse sends it up to some value, and then the system slowly decays. And we know this is the kind of behavior, for instance, with a, a, an RC network. If you were to look at the, the, a simple series RC network, you discharge a capacitor, and then you apply um, an impulse to it. Right, so like you, you turn on the voltage and turn it off suddenly, which you know is, is kind of faking it a little bit, but you get this sort of response um, coming, and we and we did that already, and you know that from your electrical circuit theory behavior and how capacitors work and so on. The main thing here is that the impulse response of a circuit of our, our, our first order system cannot be sinusoidal, so you're never going to get this and get something happening like that, never, right? So first order systems cannot give you a sinusoidal response, right? We'll see in a little while um, why, why that is important or why we may want a sinusoidal response. So in other words, they can't get oscillations. Now oscillations are something that are extremely important in, in a number of engineering applications. And um, I think in your, when you were talking, um, discussing like the suspension system in a car, for instance. If the shock absorber in a car is working well, then when you go over bumps, the car is going to oscillate, it's going to bounce around. I don't know if you've ever seen an old car where the, where the shock's not good, right? Um, you remember, it's, it, it's, uh, the car is a spring damper system. 
the spring kind of works like an inductive system. The, 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 the damper, the shock absorber works like a capacitor. So if the capacitance part of the, the, the suspension system isn't working, all you have is a, is a spring. So you go over something, you hit a bump and the car goes and it takes a long time. So it's bouncing up and down, which makes it unsafe, of course, because if the front wheels are doing that, then, then at some point in time, is it, it may lose contact with the road. So therefore, you're not, um, you're not able to steer it. But oscillations, unwanted oscillations are, are very dangerous um, behavior for, for many systems. And it is something that, that if you are a designer as an engineer, you need to know if this system will ever give you an oscillation. And this is where these sort of response um, comes in. So from the time you see that the transfer function is something like this, something, um, a first order system, something over an S plus E, right? So the highest order of S is one, then you know, okay, at least I'm not going to get any oscillations from, from, from that system. It may not behave the way I want it, but at least I'm guaranteed that if it is a first order, if whatever model I do gives me a first order transfer functions, then I am not going to get any oscillations at all. Yeah, fair enough. Comments, questions? Uh, yes, sir, question or yes, sir, clear? <laughs> Clear. <laughs> Thank you. But of course, if anybody, if you have a, if suddenly something suddenly occurs to you, um, then just just let me know. All right. So what about a step response for this? Well, the step response, of course, X S is now a unit step, um, which means that 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 or X T is a unit step. So X S is now one over S. So you put one over S into here. And then you do the same um, evaluation again. So if you do this, you're going to get this as having a K over S plus A and a K over uh, some K1 over S plus A and a K2 over S. Back to what we said, you see this is the, this is the part that looks like the input here. This is this part that is behaving like the system. You could solve for the Ks before. And then, uh, uh, as you did, so I, I didn't go through there, but it could solve for whatever K1 and K2 looks like. And notice here, the part that looks like the system, remember the transfer function is something over S plus E. So the part of this response here, this step response, that has the S plus A on it, that is the part that determines the transient response. That has no, it doesn't matter what the signal, looks like that part with the s plus a which is a system determines the transient response and if you think about it that makes a certain amount of sense because what is the transient response the transient response of a system is the system is sitting down here and nice and minding his own business you do something to the system and it has to respond so how it responds in other words how it transits from where it is to where you want it to be, that is that response, that transient response moving from point A to point B is a function of how, how the system is. Okay, so the part of once you put the step response, the part of the step response that looks like the system that has the, the, the system, um, the S plus A, and anybody remember what you call these things here? The S plus A is the, the, the um, denominator parts. What do you call that? Poles, there you go, right. So, so the part of the system that has the, 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 the expression here that has a, that is referring to the poles of the system, basically, that is what is determining the transient response. And then the other part that looks like the signal, now we have put in a step input here. So the, the other part of this response now has something over S. This determines the steady state response of, of, of the system. So that now tells you, remember the steady state is that I have made some sort of input to the system. Some point down the road, the system is going to respond and then settle down. 
So where it settles down now is a function of the input that I give it. So if I give it a, a step input, it means that I change the voltage or the current or the velocity or the temperature, whatever it is, from some value to a new value. So the final um, answer to the system, where the final state of the system has to be, will be dependent on that change that I made for it. So if it, if, if it was a, um, the input, a speed to a motor, for instance, and I change it from, let's say, 10% of its, uh, its, its maximum RPM to 40% of its maximum RPM, then the steady state response should be the 40% RPM at, 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 at the time after some period of time. How it got from the 10% to the 40% is the first part of, of, of um, the system, the transient response. So you could go all over the place, but at the end of the day, it's supposed to land up being at 40% RPM. Fair enough? Make sense? Yeah? Right, and, and here was just a, um, all right. So as I said, in time you have a question, just um, let me know. So again, a, a typical simple first order system from an electrical engineering point of view is a, is a RC circuit, and you could follow it through here. So you have a system and the time constant is one over RC. So if you um, do the evaluation that we, we had before, you're going to have a one over S, and a one over S plus whatever is the um, time constant, S plus tau in this case. If you plot it out, you plot it out, then you get the responses as we know, the input response, right, which is the, the steady state. We have the transient, sorry, the, 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 the transient response here and you have the steady state response. The transient response, is you have done something to the thing, how is it going to move from point A to point B? So if you look at it here, these are the, the, the responses in, in joint. The green, the, the, sorry, the blue bit here is the input, right? And what is the, um, this is the, the, um, what do you call it, the e to the minus t over rc, that is the transfer function part here, the one over s plus a, that is this bit. So in all, when you put everything together and you know this, this is what the system, the simple rc circuit does. So the transient part here, it was discharged and the capacitor charges up in response to the step input. So you put a step input, the system charges up and then the steady state, you remember this part is, is, a, is a function of the transfer function itself, the one over S plus A, the poles and so on. And the steady state response now where it lands up is a function of the input. Where it lands up, we put a step in, input in it, it's supposed to land up at one volt here. It does after a period of time. So this is the steady state response, a function of that unit step. Again, just verifying that we have no oscillations in here. So in other words, it's not doing anything like that or any other sort of strange behavior. Once it's a first order, you're guaranteed that you're not going to have any oscillations. What can happen, of course, is that if you, the, 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 the things that as a designer, you'll probably have to look at, and when you're doing controls, they'll, they'll run through a lot of these things. You put the step response, and this is the line it's supposed to to come up steady state at. If for some reason now it does this, right? Or it does this, or it does this, right? So in one case now, it you make the change and it very quickly goes up to the step to the final value, but it has the wrong value, it's at 1.5 here. All right? That's an issue. Or you make a, 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 a change to this thing, you put in the one volt step and it's taking forever to get up to the, um, the value. Those are the kind of things that, that the first order system will do. And that is what you as a control engineer, as, as a designer, that is where you have to, um, to, to, to work with. 
But what is not going to happen is that it's not going to do this and then start doing this kind of thing at all. All right? Okay, so let's look at second order systems. And as you can expect, um, if the first order system is going to behave in a particular way, the second order systems are not. Right, so we're going to expect some funny behavior as we start to look at the second order systems now. So the general form, of course, because it's a second order system, is going to have at least a second order derivative of both x and y inside of here. If we assume that the input is causal, so the input has no initial condition and the, and the, the first derivative of the input is also zero, we could run through ys. And this is reasonable because usually the input, we control the input. Right? And we control the input, and the typical inputs that we use are the impulse or the unit step. Okay, so we control, we, we have some control over that. So that is not a, an unreasonable assumption. So what is ys? Well, you, you, you practice and you run all the way through. And if you didn't make any mistake, you're going to get um, a two part equation. So ys has this bit here, which is the initial condition response because it has everything to do with whatever the system was doing before. And we have the input response, which is a part that is going to actually respond to whatever the input does. Just like before. So let's go with the, the, the bit where the, um, the system, we, we've um, stabilized the system a little bit. And why all of the y's are also, the, the, the y prime and the y zero minus are also zero. So we discharge everything. And this now is what we left with, with the system transfer function. So here's a sort of thing, and you could, you could prove this for yourself, but I, I'm more interested in, in what the, the, the behavior of the answer does. So here's a system. So y prime, and you know, you should know by now that this is also shorthand. You're going, you're going to meet this from time to time, right? Some, some courses, controls does it quite a bit as well. Instead of writing out dy dt, they will write y prime. d2 y dt squared, of course, is y double prime and so on. OK, it's nice shorthand. So this, you have a first order um, in terms of y um, and some variable q. And then you have another um, equation that is describing q prime, which will be dq dt, of course, in terms of y and x. So q may be what we, we spoke of, you remember, early on when we were talking about signals, q could be an internal signal. An internal signal meaning that, that what you had, so you have the, the, the system, we have y and we have x, but something going on inside of here and there's a variable which is q that is, so Y does something and it Q is worked around inside of here, might be some transistors and upper arms, internal things, and then Q is eventually converted back to X out, coming back in, right? Um, simple thing again, Y might be, let's say, um, in a practical example, might, Y might be, um, let's say blood glucose, you have a blood glucose monitor. So, so you have, you know, those ones that you see them advertised on television or where, where, where they have the patch on, on your shoulder. So it is measuring something from your blood glucose and the output is going to be another signal. So one, one might be an electrical signal and the other one is, 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 is an output, the glucose concentration for argument's sake, you know. Q is what is going on inside, so it's converting one to the other. And this now is a relationship. If I ask you to find what the transfer function, you want to know what is the relationship between y and x, so you have to get rid of q inside of here, right? And you could do that. You would do that. I mean, I'd leave that up to the, uh, as a little homework exercise for you. How do you get rid of q from given those two um, equations in front there? 
if you did it and you assume all the, the initial conditions are zero, you're supposed to get something looking like this. Okay? If you didn't, or I made a mistake, just let me know. But let's say that was whatever arbitrary you think that that that, that um, description was for those two equations. You get rid of the internal and you have y and x now the input and output. And the transfer function of, of, of the system is that expression below here. You notice that s there's a s to the power two, so this is a second order system that we're dealing with here. So how does that behave? Well, let's see what it does for an impulse. If an if it's an impulse, xs is one. So if xs is one, you put xs equal to one here. And then you do your usual things here. You separate that into partial fractions and you solve. You see for this particular case, right? There's an S plus two and an S plus four. So this system has two poles. It's a second order system. So it has two poles to it. So YT is going to be these two exponents here, an E to the minus two T and an E to the minus four T. Plot it out. The e to the minus 2t is the green up on top, the green line on top here. So this is e to the minus 2t is this. e to the minus 4t is a decaying exponential, but a much sharper decaying one. So minus e to the minus 2t will be a sharp exponent going this way. So when you add them up, you get this behavior here. Notice what is happening here. This sort of behavior, you couldn't get that. The first order system would never give you a response. Right? There's an impulse response. So the first order system gave you this, like the RC system, it did that and then decayed. This thing is doing our eyes. Right, which is the kind of behavior that you, 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 you wouldn't have gotten as yet. And we're going to see how, how um, that it gets even worse. But everybody following so far? Any um, concerns? Not clear? All right, good. So, Let's get a little more general, therefore. We, we, we have a, a second order system, and I've now put some constants inside of here. So we have a general form second order system. There's some b is u squared on top, and below the, 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 the denominator is s squared plus 2k is u s plus is u squared. There's a general form. And it's just to make it simple um, by having this as a function of, as a multiple of that, it just makes it a little bit easier mathematically to work on, right? Just for our explanations. But you could always get it into that form. You could always take any number and you could just scale. If I give you any, any sort of equation like this one, this one here, it is possible you could take this, here and very easily convert that into this form here. Okay, it's just a question of equating the, the coefficients and, and, and solving for B and um, B is U and K. All right, so it's not that strange. So let's see what happens. B there, there are constants. B is U and K are constants. And let's see what the step response of this is. So xs is 1 over s. So you put xs is 1 over s into that. And so it starts to get kind of big now. This bit here, that is s plus something, s plus into s plus something. Whatever that is, you use a quadratic formula and you solve that. You're accustomed doing that kind of thing. So the step response of that system is going to come out into a three-part expression. Something over S, 
then something over s plus whatever this is, and then something over s plus whatever that is. It is a second order system, right? So it must have, because it's a second order system, it must have at least two poles, right? All right, so here's one pole here, and here's the other pole here. You remember, this is the in, this is this is the input response here. This has to do with the input itself. So this is not a pole, but the actual transfer function bit here. This transfer function here, because we have an S squared, this has two poles to it, and one of the poles is. here and the other pole is here okay fair enough wherever those happen to turn off this is just algebra right you work out this and just verify you work it out and you try not to make any mistakes and you will get the expression looking like what we have on the last line here so notice the indices here Right, so we have, if I take this now, if I take this now and, and, and find the inverse Laplace transform of it, this part is going to give me, this is going to give me something UT, AUT. This is B, E, because this is S plus whatever, let's say, let's say this is um, alpha, right? If this whole thing is alpha, so this is going to give me a B e to the minus alpha t. And if this big thing below here is beta, this is going to give me a C e to the beta um, t, e to the minus beta t, right? Which is what I have here. Fair enough? Yeah, no, maybe? You can sense? Right. So now what we're going to do now is to see what happens inside of here as we vary the value of k. This might look, as you say, we have an e to the minus something here and an e to the minus something inside of here. So let's see what happens now. If k is less than zero, if k is less than zero, some, some, some behaviors would, would happen to this thing. First off, once k is less than zero, then if k is negative, that's for argument's sake, so let's say k is minus four. If k is minus four, this first k here, it means this insider here is going to be a negative inside of here. If k is minus four, then this um, k squared, the square root of that is still going to be positive, but they're going to have an e to the minus a zero by some minus something. So the net result is that this whole thing here is going to give me an e to the plus somebody. Same thing here, k minus, the, the k squared minus one, this is going to be less than that. k squared minus, the square root of k squared minus one is smaller than k anyway. So inside of here, this is also going to be minus so the net result, the minus and the minus, we're also going to have an e to the plus something inside of here. All right? So once k is negative, less than zero, and I'll come to this 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 in a second, once k is less than, than, than zero, this exponent on top here is going to be e to the plus something either way. e to the plus anything is a growing exponent. You plot that out, Plot that out, and it looks like that. Yeah? So that is never, if this is time going on, and you have a system whose response, a step response. Remember what a step response is? I have this system, and I have put a unit step onto the system. It's this system now. When I put a unit step, it does this. It starts, and it keeps going, and it's going, and it's going, right? It will go until it blows a fuse or it saturates at VCC plus. Or if this is a motor, for instance, it suddenly speeds up until it can't speed up anymore. Or it speeds up so fast that something breaks. 
that kind of thing. That is, is, is clearly unstable response. You don't want to, you, you, you never want something like that to, to occur. A step response is as simple as putting, putting power on. So this absolutely must not happen. Just back to this first scenario here now. Not only k less than, uh, than, than, than zero, but let's look at specifically if k is between one, minus one and zero. If k is between minus one and zero, then this bit here is going to be imaginary. You're going to have the square root of a negative number here. So we, what we're going to land up with is an e to the plus inside of here is going to have a real part and a imaginary part inside of here, right? A plus or a minus imaginary part. Yeah? And e to the, if I open this up, e to the plus a t, for instance, by e to the plus or minus j, let's say b t. Right? E to the minus j b t, that's a complex exponential. Right? And you remember, e is cosine plus j sine, right? E to the e to the j omega t is cosine plus j sine. So anytime this thing becomes complex, part of the answer, we're going to have the going exponent here, which we had before. But on top of that, we're going to have a sinusoid a cosine plus a j sine, either the sine or the cosine part, it doesn't matter. So the output for this particular one now, that particular thing is going to look, remember what we did. So you have, you have the step input, but the output now, so the input, sorry, let me put it, this is the input here, the output, Part of it is a going exponent, but another part of it is a sinusoid because it's a, it has an e to the either plus or minus j b t. So the output, the net output now is going to be in fact something looking like this. You're going to have a going exponential output with oscillations. So not only is the, the output going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but it's going to oscillate. There's going to be either a sinusoid or a cosinusoid. It's the same thing, just, just, just out of phase by 90 um, degrees. So just think of it again, like, um, for instance, a, 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 a motor, what would that do? Instead of it, you, you tell it to change speed from um, 20 RPM to, to 100 RPM. And instead of it doing what it's supposed to do and set it to 100 RPM, it starts to increase, but in, it in, is increasing on, on oscillating. So it's going up very high, come down to nothing, go up very high to come down, but keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until eventually something gives way. All right? So in this particular case, you're already seeing that this second order system, not only um, it could get unstable on you, but then depending on what happens to the value, that value of K, the system can also oscillate. You could get that kind of, that, that sort of sinusoid behavior happening. Everybody following? Yeah? All right. So we have some more to discuss on this, but I'll continue this um, discussion in tomorrow's class because we will run through this and then um, take questions at that point. What I will do probably tomorrow too, in the second half of the class, we could have a small tutorial on problem set one, right? So we could finish off the discussions on this because this will take us a little while um, to, to finish off. We have some other slides to do and, and to, to generalize. And um, then we will have um, a tutorial on problem set one in the second half of the class. All right, I hope that you all at least have a chance to look at it all right, it's always good to, to, to um, have an idea of the, the, the problem so that you could at least 
participate. It doesn't make no sense. We going through the solutions if you never did attempt them. So at least have a look at it first. Um, see if things what, what where are you getting stuck, and then um, we'll we'll clarify that point in time. All right. So if we have no other questions at this point, look at what we did here. Think carefully about it. If anything isn't making any sense, and then um, tomorrow we'll continue this part and finish this bit, and then have a small tutorial again. All right. Okay, so if that's the case, then